Parking Meter Project rakes in 3.4 million in two months. AG to explain to the president about the alleged death threats to a judge. East and West Front Road squatters excited to be relocated. Economist says the government has failed terribly. Hunt still on for a GCAM chairperson. City Hall on a rate recovery drive. All resources should be used to develop Guyana. Nurses must rewrite exam for a third time. No charges will be filed over the importation of fake tuna. Acid attack victim pleads for the assistance to have corrective surgery. Those are our top headlines for the week ending March 31. Welcome to MTV's News Updates Week in Review for the week ending March 31. I am Trisha Ramlal. Good afternoon. President David Granger has finally broken his silence following the allegation of a death threat reportedly made by his Attorney General Basil Williams. The President has asked for an explanation from Minister Williams. Find out more in this report. Head of State David Granger says he will not pronounce any judgment either against or for Attorney General Basil Williams. The Attorney General has responded. I have uh, asked for an explanation of the matters which were reported to me and when I've had that opportunity I will uh, respond to him and to the Chancellor of the Judiciary. Attorney General Basil Williams has been implicated for threatening Justice Franklin Holder during a cross-examination case. The allegation was made by Attorney Anil Nanlal, who is representing M. Battle Carvel Duncan, member of the Public Service Commission, Police Service Commission and the Judicial Service Commission. President Granger, however, asserted that the matter will be resolved. But I am very confident that the matter will be resolved, but I ask for the opportunity. Uh, you know, in law, there is the principle of hearing the other side, so we mustn't jump to conclusions. So I want to hear both sides. We've heard one side in the media. I've asked the Attorney General for his side. Only yesterday, the Attorney General refused to give an apology to the judge. Instead, he chose to blame Anil Nanlal for the present dilemma. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. During the two months of the parking meter project, motorists were forced to pay a total of $3.4 million to Smart City Solutions. From this sum, City Hall was paid a mere $680,000, which represents their 20%. The dreaded parking meter project, which was brought to a screeching halt earlier this month, has helped the City Hall accumulate $680,000. This was confirmed today by the City's Treasurer, Ron McCallman. He noted in the first month, only 127,000 was collected by the council, but in February, City Hall received over $500,000. So the two months that uh, the parking meter would have been in, in, in process, we would have collected uh, almost $680,000 for the two months. Despite the council was earning needed revenues from the parking meter project, it was suspended by the government due to the many protests held to scrap the meter deal. Minister of State Joseph Harman had stated that the three-month suspension is to facilitate consultation with the civil society to find an amicable solution. However, the civil society groups who protested against the meter initiative are adamant that the deal must be scrapped. He also said that the time should be used to revise the ratio, which he said heavily favors smart city solutions. City Hall is only receiving 20% of the gross revenue, while the Meteor Company is carting off with a lion's share of 80%. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. As U.S. oil giant ExxonMobil continues to find more oil in Guyana's waters, Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu says the oil revenues should not be used as a tool for any government to enrich itself, but it should instead be used to benefit all Guyanese. Find out more from Nikhil Jondu. Experts in the field of oil and gas are in Guyana for a two-day seminar to provide the country with practical steps to better manage the looming profits that are coming from the industry. Addressing the gathering was Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu, who opined that with the recent decline of the sugar industry, diversification of the oil and gas industry is necessary. He pointed out that during a recent visit to the oil rig of Guyana's coast, the aquaculture industry has a lot of potential. Prime Minister Nagamutu asserted that the oil revenues which will be garnered can go into the health and educational sectors to advance the future generations. And not just the access to getting any 
as opportunities present themselves by governments that only think not about the future but to think about the next elections. I read many years ago that I'm told that a politician looks at the next elections, but a statesman looks at the next generation. And so we like our resources to be to spread into the future. The Prime Minister noted the importance of having legislations in place to avoid the abuse of oil proceeds at the highest level of any government. While we can understand that there would be resistance by persons in public offices, including ministers and members of parliament, and including the president and the prime minister, there could be some level of resistance to the declaration of assets to avoid anyone in governments slipping through the back door, side agreements and side benefits that result in unjust enrichment and perhaps disproportionate wealth. <coughs> we have to push through with this agenda to ensure that there is public accountability and the government ought to be able to set the example. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Already frustrated, students at the Georgetown School of Nursing are now being told that they have to rewrite the exam for a third time following a high failure rate in their final state exam. Here is Sandy Ramutar. The disgruntled nurses claim they have been betrayed and tricked by the Public Health Ministry to reset the final state exam, which came as a result of an alleged breach. It has basically propaganda and us nurses being used as pawns in a political game. Following an engagement with Public Health Minister Walter Lawrence, they were told that a review of their exams paper would not be possible. As such, they were asked to again reset the exam with a promise to have possession of their papers for individual reviewing. Um, the minister said that there will be no review or remarking of the paper when we met with her. She said that when um, the papers were marked, MCLEX gave an individual comment to the, um, to the names. But to date, she said that will be provided to us, but to date, that wasn't provided. She also said that we will get our percentage mm -hmm. of how we did in the examination, and it hasn't been provided as yet either. According to them, they are drained by the royal run around they are getting from the Nursing Council and the Public Health Ministry. Claiming they were unfairly treated, they believe the last sitting of the exam was again tampered. I will, I will go to the end with it, and I will have my review when we are the next. Right, so the nurses, majority of them are tired from the, the battle, and that, that, is, that was it, that is all along. So it tired us out to a point whereby people would stop supporting certain things, just give up and receive the exam. Following an alleged breach which was discovered in the clinical and functional examination paper, the nursing council had deemed the exam null and void. As a result of the alleged breach, which is still under investigation, the students were asked to reset the exam last month, with most of the students from Georgetown failing. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The Government Analyst Food and Drug Department will not be filing charges against G. Bacchus Enterprise for importing fake tuna, as the process is too tedious. This is according to the Director of the Department, Marlon Cole. Here is more from Sandy Ramutar. The government announced its food and drug department last week barred a large shipment of tuna from entering Guyana as it was deemed inauthentic. Since then, the importer of the product, G. Bacchus Enterprise, has denied they were bringing in fake tuna to the country. However, the food and drug department has affirmed that the product is indeed a phony representation of Brunswick tuna. The director of the department says an infringement was affirmed to furnish findings from a Canadian-based company who distributes the product. Then is when a decision was taken to do further investigation and verification with the official company that distributes Brunswick Tuna, that is a company out of Canada. They would have furnished the department with official information and directives as it relates to the infringement. And that is when we recognize with com um, communication that this product is false and misleading and deceptive. According to Cole, the product was released by inspectors at the ports of entry following the process of documentation. However, after inspection of a sample of the product, it was deemed false and misleading by the department. 
As such, the 2,000 cases of tuna had to be rejected to ensure consumers are not put at risk when consuming food. Despite noting that the action committed by an importer is a criminal offence, Cole says the department will not be filing charges against them as the process is a tedious one. However, the department welcomes any legal battle that may be put forward by the importer who claims the product is authentic. In many cases to um, initiate procedural um, uh, charges against defaulters, but our efforts are being frustrated when we go to the court because in most, if not all cases, when we have forgery in the department, when we have um, composition being not, milk is not imported, not in the prescribed form or composition, we would take those matters to the court and we'd be very, very frustrated because in most cases, procedurally, it is being thrown out uh, by the magistrate. Meantime, the importer G. Bacchus Enterprise has already made it public that they'll be finding legal action against the department on the grounds of false information. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Outspoken economist Raymond Gaskin, who supported the coalition government prior to their victory in the May 2015 election, says the government is a total failure. Gaskin was asked how he would rate the government's performance over the two-year period. Find out more in this report. The present government is a total failure and a total disappointment. I had supported them once, and I, I thought better of them. I thought they would have done better. Total failure and a total disappointment. They have done nothing in two years that I can think about. I don't know if you could think about anything, but I can't think about anything. Local economist Raymond Gaskin says the most spectacular thing the coalition government has done is to raise their salaries in the first few months in office. Gaskin also criticized the government for adding military officers to run the affairs of the country. They bring in all their bodies and the squaddies from the army. That's all they've done. They haven't done anything else. And they're laying off people in the sugar industry and they don't have jobs for them. And they're mucking around with the vendors and they're screwing around with parking meters and a lot of BS all over the place. Gaskin believes that public servants are not adequately represented by its president, Patrick Yard. The Economist also believes that Yard should not be president of the union because he has failed the working class. Total, complete, unmitigated disaster of no mean order for 30 years. It's a complete and total failure. He sits there inside of the union, he rig up all the elections. He got all his cronies there with him, and he put them in place, and they put him in place, and he put them there. I used to work with the PSU in 99, and it's a total disaster. The, the, the public servants have to get together and get rid of him. The earlier, the better. Meanwhile, the People's Progressive Party has time and again labeled the coalition as a dismal failure, as their promises have been shattered by their actions. The PPP had claimed that the government is a taxation one that feeds off of the people to obtain revenues instead of attracting investors. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. As the hunt for a chairman for GCOM is still on, the opposition party as of March 29 is in receipt of 15 names submitted by civil society for the appointment of a chairperson for the Guyana Elections Commission. Following consultations, some members of civil society have expressed concerns over the criteria outlined by the head of state, according to opposition chief whip Gilty Shearer. There are 15 names, they're not 15 individual names, there are 15 submissions, submissions. in other words. But there are some uh, civil society bodies who have indicated that when they have examined the criteria, even when they come up with names, not one name can fulfill the entire criteria. While a number of organizations have submitted names, others have requested an extension as they could not immediately recommend names suitable under the conditions listed. Meanwhile, other members of civil society have indicated that some names submitted might not be in keeping with the guidelines established by President David Granger. His Excellency the President has gone beyond the Constitution and placed undue restrictions and pressure and duress on the selection of the position of chairperson which the Constitution itself did not contemplate. Contending that the head of state has undermined the Constitution, Tishira says her party will be examining the recommended names during this week, after which they'll be presenting a second list of six names to the President. 
The list of nominees, which was earlier submitted to the president by opposition leader Barbara Chaglia, was rejected by the former, who deeming it unconstitutional based on nominees' qualifications. As such, the opposition leader was requested to submit a second list. Sandy Ramotar for MTV's News Update. Squatters of East and West Front Road, Rumveld, lauded the Central Housing and Planning Authority for the relocation process and are hopeful that better living conditions will be provided. This comes against the backdrop of the planned move of the CH and PA to relocate all squatters in the mentioned areas due to environmental complications. Sandy Ramatar visited the area and spoke with the residents. When News Update visited East and West Front Road squatting area, trespassers were quick to share their concerns about the relocation process. Many have expressed optimism of being placed in a healthier environment. However, some of them are requesting financial assistance from the Central Housing and Planning Authority to help build their houses following their relocation. But me, me agreement is like, if I, if I move, right, they got to put me somewhere better. Well, seeing that I have my children and I'm a single parent, if they do decide to move us, they need to put something in place for me. Seeing that I pay a rent. If I was living on free, I would do something on my own. It'll be okay to move us from here and then thing, right? Long to find place for us to go. No, me ain't got no problem moving. And my wife and them now get no problem moving either. We feel all right. We don't have a problem with it. The only thing like, we want to know is where we're going and so far we're going. But we have a problem. We're ready for moving already. How we know we got to move? Oh, I feel so glad. I was dreaming and hoping. Like how they say Christ coming, is this I hoping and waiting for. Yeah, I need betterments in life. Like, you know, but they gotta, they gotta show more interest. Like, if they're moving me right, if they're moving me, they should put me somewhere better and perfect. Give me jobs and these kind of things. The people in front of there are not just cleaning, look right down there, are not cleaning the, the, the canal. So, that's why the water is standing right now in front of here, it's very smelly. Because the water is not moving. So, and some of them, they don't have, you know, toilet facilities and those things, and they are not healthy for us here. According to them, over the last 30 years, there was not any development in the area as the government did not provide any assistance. Sharing mixed reactions about their livelihood, many vented about the steady crimes perpetuated in the area, while others described the community as a peaceful one. I am comfortable living here. Put aside the crime rate, the pollution, terrible. But I is one once the say remove, I really not even have to know is where. Once it's some house so the scheme, you can better than here. It's going to be different, but we're going to adjust to wherever we go. It's going to be all right. We can got to get some type of assistance, some type of little finance and material or something. I got no problem because it's not me alone. I got my family. Minister Adams Patterson had indicated that squatters along Sapphire, East and West Front Road canals will be relocated by May. This is being done to facilitate the cleaning of the canals. A plan was also formulated for residents occupying lands that are not reserved for roadways, drainage canals and community playgrounds to pay for the land they occupy. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. City Hall will commence a rate recovery drive in April to obtain billions of dollars property owners in the city still have outstanding. For three months in the year so far, over $3 million in rates and taxes is yet to be paid to the council. According to the city's treasurer, Ron McCallman, rates and taxes account for 61% of the total proposed revenue for the council for 2017, yet majority of business owners refuse to pay the sum. It is due to the fact that City Hall is still financially vulnerable that the council will be taking stringent measures to obtain monies owed to them. The council has embarked on a great recovery drive, which will commence on the 3rd or the 4th of April. We will tackle or uh, share notices in the various parts. City Hall will first be attacking four areas to collect their debts, Kitty, North and South Cumminsburg and Lazy Town. The city's treasurer went on to list the areas that owe the council huge sums. Kingston, 
We have four hundred and seventy six million dollars outstanding, and that is just the principal. Uh, in list down, we have one hundred and fifteen million dollars. Uh, North Covingsburg, one hundred and eighty five. South Commons were three hundred and seventeen million dollars. The council will then move on to other areas in the city to collect outstanding rates and taxes and expects to cover the entire city within two months. City Hall will also publish the names of persons who owe them. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. After two months of surviving an acid attack by her reputed husband, the mother of two, Chanel Williamson, decided to open to the media. Williamson explains how she is being supported over her time of recovery. Find out more in this report. Well, as I was in there, I wasn't depressed. I was just letting God take everything. He was in control. I had a lot of support from the nurses down there, thanks to them, and my sister. For my kids here in the voice, it had helped me out a lot, and God. Shondell Williamson spent approximately nine weeks in the Georgetown Public Hospital fighting to save her sight. With the assistance of Saving Hands Emergency Aid, Shia, treatment has been able to be secured for her at a top U.S. hospital. There, she will be able to have her face reconstructed. 26-year-old Shondell Williamson of 16 New Street, New Amsterdam, suffered burns about her face and body after the father of her two children reportedly threw acid on her. Williamson explained that the father of her children, Alfred De Jong, was abusive so she decided to end the relationship. However, De Jong was not willing to let go of her, which led to the horrific ordeal. Every time I leave it, I always move home back by my mother. And he would come and he would say he's sorry and he wouldn't do it again and I would just forgive him because I mean it's long now we're together and I don't want to leave him and go and get somebody else and maybe I'll end up into worse. Hmm? So I just used to say maybe he would change, he would change but hmm, he never did. Hmm? Williamson says what is even harder is that her children keep their distance since the incident occurred. She also had a word of caution for those women who are going through abusive relationships. Well, they talked to me, they looked at me, but they wouldn't be very close to me. If I say come touch me, they will say no, but they're just there talking to me as normal. Oh, that is painful. They should look at it. And that we women are like their mother. We do doing everything just like their mother. We do cooking for them, cleaning their clothes, washing their clothes, doing everything. It's just that we women please them in the emotion way. But their mother don't. So why? If you don't raise your hand to your mother, why is it you're raising your hand to your woman? It's not good. Mm? Just stop it. Mm? She has been cared for by her sister Latoya Williamson. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Week in Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us tomorrow, Monday, April 3, for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I am Trisha Amla, thanking you for watching.